Hi everybody, I want to thank you all for coming today. Welcome, my name is Vincent Rossi. I'm the coordinator for the Rancho Bernardo Historical Society Speaker Series. And uh, before we introduce our program, I'll st first I want to ask, uh, I have, always have to ask if anyone with a cell phone could either uh, turn them off or put them on um, vibrate for the duration of the program, we appreciate it. Uh, just mention uh, some of our upcoming events. Our 12th annual Pancake Festival takes place on uh, May the 29th. Uh, military veterans and active duty uh, people eat, eat free, and there's a lot of festivities, and we'll be, there's uh, tickets available, uh, and you can check that out, more about that on our, on our website. Our next speaker on September the 10th will be Michael Yi, president of the Chinese. Did I say, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> June 10th, excuse me. Michael Yi, president of the Chinese uh, Historical Museum of San Diego. He will be speaking about the events, struggles, and successes of the Chinese and Chinese American people in San Diego County from the late 1850s to the present day. Our speaker today, Eric Larson, has been the executive director of the San Diego County Farm Bureau since January of 1997. His professional activities have included two years as president of the San Diego County Flower and Plant Association. He also serves as director of the Southern California Water Committee and a member of the Southern California Agricultural Water Team. In addition to his work in agriculture, he served two terms as a member of the Carlsbad City Council and as a past director of the Carlsbad Municipal Water District, the San Diego County Water Authority, and the Encino Wastewater Authority. And I can vouch for Eric's expertise on agriculture. He's been a very trusted source of mine for uh, articles that I've written for Edible San Diego Magazine on agricultural issues. That's when I first made his acquaintance and I'm very happy that he has chosen to speak here today on the history of agriculture in San Diego County. I'm very happy to welcome Mr. Eric Larson. Thank you. Well, I, I certainly appreciate the invitation to talk to you today. Um, I, as, as explained, I'm the executive director of the San Diego County Farm Bureau. So my, my job is really dealing with policy and issues to keep the current population of farmers on the land and doing everything that's possible to keep them here and create opportunities for new farmers as well. But in that, I get a chance to study the history of agriculture a little bit. It just kind of comes my way. But just so you know, my family has a long history of agriculture in San Diego County. Uh, my paternal grandfather was the largest producer of wine grapes in San Diego County in the area known as Bostonia, which is now the heart of El Cajon. He had about 400 acres of wine grapes there until Prohibition came. <laughs> and uh, the Catholic Church did not buy enough wine grapes to keep him in business because they were the only customer he had at the time. So he sold that property and became a wheat farmer in the Tulare area of Central California. On my mother's side of the family, my, uh, paternal, paternal, my maternal great-grandfather was one of the uh, early avocado growers and was an avocado grower in the city of Encinitas before they realized actually places like Fallbrook and Valley Center were a better place to grow avocados than people originally thought in Encinitas. On my wife's side of the family, um, my wife is a descendant of, a, of an original um, Rancho family here. She's uh, in the Osuna family, in the Pico family. Um, and so they have a long cattle ranching, flower growing, vegetable growing history as well. So I, I kind of embrace the history. I like it. I kind of like to know a little bit about it, tell my children about it and do that. So anyway, Farm Bureau itself, the organization, we're a nonprofit advocacy group for farmers. Our motto is the voice of local farmers. And so that's, that's the work that we do. Um, even though it says San Diego County Farm Bureau in the name, people always confuse us as a government agency. We're not. We're a nonprofit organization supported by the farmers um, in San Diego County. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some history. Um, it, it's really difficult to, to get your arms around the history of agriculture in San Diego County because it's as varied as the communities are varied in San Diego. Physically, we're such a large county, one of the largest counties in the whole country. There's I think we're third, fourth, or fifth largest county landmass wise in the United States. And so there's all this variety of agriculture that we've, we've had here over the years. People have come and experimented with a lot of different things. Uh, but nonetheless, there's unsubstantiated stories. When, when explorers first arrived in San Diego County, especially in the Escondido area, they discovered the Indians had actually taken seedling oak trees and were planting them in rows and were cultivating them and carrying water to these trees because their, their diet was very, very dependent on, on the acorns and on the oak trees, and they were actually farming those oak trees. Um, but when agriculture really started to flourish in San Diego County, 
was when the missions were built. I think this is a depiction of missions, or maybe uh, Mission San Diego. This, this drawing might be from maybe up in an area, um, maybe the Hillcrest area looking down in the valley, regardless. But when the missionaries came to San Diego County and they built uh, San Diego de Alcala and San Luis Rey Mission, and they brought, they brought the, the, the native folks together and they brought the Spaniards that came with them together, they had to start creating food. You can no longer depend on hunting and gathering. They had to start creating crops. So they brought with them crops like olives and, and grapes, and then they brought goats and sheep and cattle. So agriculture really started to, to, to take place in San Diego County around those missions as they had to sustain the populations that were there. Um, cattle really stuck. Uh, this area, this was a big giant cattle ranch where, where we are right now. And, and you look at most of San Diego County, cattle was an extremely easy thing to produce. They would just take them, just literally turn them loose out into the back country and then go gather them up. You know, turn them loose in the springtime, gather them up in the fall. And, and there were cattle all over San Diego County. It was really a, a really large uh, cattle producing area. You could dry the meat. There was no refrigeration, so you had an opportunity to do this. So cattle ranching was, was really kind of ubiquitous all over um, San Diego County. And it's still a big reason that we don't have a huge native forest land because cattle eat everything. And so if you go back into Santa Isabel and areas where it's pretty flat and you see all the grazing land, go back several hundred years ago, it was probably pretty robust oak forests, uh, but none of our sycamore forests in, in the river valleys, but the, the cattle would eat just about everything. Very popular also was dry land farming. We don't have much rain here, you all know about that. And so we actually produce quite a bit of grain here, but it was a very feast or famine enterprise for people to enter into because it all depended on whether there was enough rainfall or not to sustain and, and, and germinate the seeds that were, that were produced here. Um, and in places like Escondido Valley, and this is there, uh, we grew a lot of things like grapes. These are grapes, they didn't even trellis them, they just let them grow out on the ground and would go out and harvest them. Grapes grown for raisins. We produced a lot of raisins in San Diego County at the time. Uh, uh, a great plant was a very good plant for San Diego County before we had a manufactured water delivery system because if you don't get rain one year, the plant just kind of hunkers down and waits for rain the next year. So we had a lot of grapes grown in places like Escondido, places like Santee, places like, um, like El Cajon. So grapes were a very, very um, popular crop that were produced in San Diego County. The significant thing that affected agriculture in San Diego County moved us from this dry land farming cattle ranching was when we started damming up all the rivers in San Diego County. And as you likely know, every single river in San Diego County was eventually dammed up by the 1920s. So we had dams on every single river to take, to take advantage of all of the, what, what little, take advantage of what little surface water we had. And so if you were a farmer downstream of those rivers, we now had a system where we could come in and deliver water to the farms. And we started to produce crops that we could irrigate. Crops like citrus. Citrus probably became the big and really the cutting edge irrigated crop that we had in San Diego County. And it was in virtually every neighborhood. Downtown San Diego, the whole Balboa Park area, South Park, uh, North Park, everything, all citrus trees, Lemon Grove, uh, all these areas, um, um, Chula Vista, uh, Pacific Beach, tremendous amount of citrus was grown in those areas. And San Diego was a real leading uh, grower of citrus because we had dammed up the rivers and water was then available and the building of those dams on all of our rivers was largely led by the agriculture community because they knew that this was a wonderful place to grow things. We had some flat land, which unfortunately now is occupied by houses, but we had some flat land, some good soils, if we just had water we could grow crops like citrus and that's exactly what happened. So the farmers really led the charge to build those dams um, and once those dams were built, everybody realized, oh, now we can water houses as well. So people could live here. It wasn't just for agriculture anymore. Um, just so you know, this was a meeting of the farmers at the, um, I, think, I forget which theater was, Spreckles Theater, I think, downtown San Diego in 1914. All the farmers in San Diego County decided to organize and created the Farm Bureau, the organization I worked for. So 100 years ago, um, they did that and, 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 and got themselves organized. Here comes an old friend. Gabby, how are you? Good. And so um, this is a picture that taken. Everybody, I love this picture. All these farmers are all in coats and ties. They went to downtown San Diego to organize themselves. It's a, a great picture. It's a picture a little over 100 years ago. But when we look at the 
community histories, it's really interesting the things that people did. So um, along the I-15 corridor in Kent Pendleton, cattle ranches. It was just cattle, 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 all in those areas, as I said. Carlsbad was a potato growing area. That coastal hill that faced the, faced the ocean proved to be a very good place to grow potatoes. There grew a lot of potatoes in, in Carlsbad. Mission Valley and San Luis Rey Valley were, were both spotted with dairies, full of dairies. Um, no accident that they built the dairies near rivers. It was a really good way to get rid of your manure. You get a great, you get a great rain event, and all of a sudden the manure you put by the river just kind of disappeared. And so, so the San Luis Rey Valley and the Mission Valley, and we had about 150 dairies in San Diego at one time by about the 1950s. Encinitas became known as the flower capital of the world. A uh, large number of field-grown flowers and eventually became greenhouse flowers as well. Not much of it there anymore. Pacific Beach, and I could add Chula Vista to that list too, lemons. In fact, Chula Vista was the largest producer of lemons in the United States at some time. Several packing houses producing a tremendous amount of lemons. Ramona, turkey capital of the United States. Uh, a lot of turkeys up, uh, in Ramona and uh, Fallbrook, olives. There was also a very substantial planting of olives in Spring Valley as well, to the point that they have an olive pressing mill in, in, in um, Spring Valley. Uh, the area that's now La Costa, La Costa Golf Course, all lima beans. Very big lima bean producing area, very important during World War I. Lima beans grown in San Diego County were dry, and the soldiers, when they went to war, they, you know, in their backpack, they had a bunch of lima beans, because I just throw some water on them, the things would, and, and cook them the way they'd go. Uh, Otay Mesa, a lot of grain was grown in Otay Mesa, very flat area. Julian uh, grew a lot of apples to the point where they had an apple distribution center in Los Angeles, an apple distribution center in downtown San Diego. Now, we still think of Julian as apples, but if you go up here and buy an apple pie, I get to tell you the apple pie came from Washington State. But nonetheless, there's a little bit of a, of a resurgence of apples in Julian for cider. Not necessarily for pies and for consuming, but folks are figuring out on the cider thing. So if you look at that county history, you got the native people I talked about, you then had the missionary influence, and then you had this period of dry farming, cattle, and limited irrigation. In 1939, the county of San Diego started to actually measure the value of the crops that we produce in San Diego County, and they've done that every year since. So in 1939, the leading crop in San Diego County was lemons. And again, as I mentioned, it was really in those coastal flatlands, Pacific Beach, Chula Vista, National City, those areas down by San Diego Bay, they were, lemons really love the coastal influence, they do really well there, it's, it's no accident that, that the real substantial lemon growing area we have right now is, is in the Rancho Santa Fe area, it's very spotted throughout there, but we produce a lot of lemons in Rancho Santa Fe. Further up the coast, Ventura grows a lot of lemons, they have that same nice cool uh, coastal weather. In 1945, vegetables became the top crop we grew in this county, largely because uh, there was such a military buildup in San Diego County. And you really had to, in the 1940s, an area really was still very dependent on the farms around them. We didn't have good refrigeration, we didn't have much in the way of transportation, so if you wanted certain things, and so uh, by that point in time, the Navy had bought Camp Pendleton, they had established the naval bases in, in San Diego, um, North Island had been there for quite some time, so they set, they, they contracted with the farmers in San Diego County to grow vegetables to feed this, this military buildup. So eventually became the top crop in San Diego County. In 1948, post World War II, massive increase of population in San Diego County, largely because defense contractors then located here. After World War II, all these people would come to San Diego as part of the war effort, and when it was time to do more contracting to build uh, more planes and rockets and everything was built after World War II. Uh, you probably know this history, San Diego became the location of a lot of military contractors and milk had to be produced near the point of, con of, of, of consumption. Uh, it didn't travel well, so all of a sudden all these dairies, this explosion of dairies we had, and so in 1948 milk became the top product we, we produced in San Diego County. Even though we have this very large presence of cattle ranching throughout San Diego County in its, in its history back to the 1700s, in 1950, we had such a buildup of beef production, it became the top produced crop in San Diego County. Then in 1956, there was um, a real uh, a discovery of in the San Luis Rey Valley in Carlsbad and in Encinitas that it was a really excellent place to grow what we call pulled tomatoes. And a pole tomato, you grow, when you grow tomatoes in your backyard, you, know, you put them on a pole or you put them on a trellis and you get them up and they can ripen right on the vine and you can hand pick them. 
Most tomatoes are not grown that way. Most tomatoes in the United States are just grown on the ground and they just spread and they're picked with tractors. But in San Diego County, we've picked tomatoes by hand and we still do that today. We grow, it's called vine ripe tomatoes and they're very, very popular. And so those coastal areas grew really nice tomatoes. And so if you were back in Encinitas in 1956 or you were in Oceanside in 1956, you would have seen all the hillsides covered with, with tomatoes. In 1966, largely due to the turkey farmers in Ramona who were no longer competitive producing turkeys because a lot of that, that business had gone to the San Joaquin Valley, they, were, they knew how to take care of birds and so they switched over to eggs. And so we had a, a tremendous number of egg ranches in the, in the Ramona area and the Escondido area and eggs became the top crop <coughs> that we produced in San Diego County. In 1976, driven mostly by the desire and investment tax credits and, the, and, and a lot of developers who came in and developed areas like Fallbrook and Valley Center into 5, 10, and 15 acre parcels and planted them with avocados and then sold those off like a, just, like, just like, like, like speculators building a subdivision of houses, they were building subdivisions of farms, but mostly avocados and selling them. And that's how we have this, we have, right now today, we have a very large parcelized avocado industry um, the mean size of an avocado grove in this county is four acres, even though we have some that are you know, hundreds of acres large. But it was largely because these developers came in and the avocado industry was very robust. So in 1976, tree fruit became the top crop in our county. And again, uh, led, led largely by the avocado industry. Then in 1978, largely because Los Angeles at one time was the number one agricultural county in the nation, Orange County was one time the number one agricultural county in the United States because they were both just really excellent, excellent growing areas. Very flat, very deep fertile soil. They had plenty of water. Orange County had groundwater and Los Angeles had brought water down from the east side of the Sierras. Mulholland had brought the water down into Los Angeles. So especially the um, San Fernando Valley became very, very robust um, production areas. But nurseries also grew up in Orange County in LA, mostly to provide the landscape plants for the mass development that was taking place in the San Fernando Valley, Los Angeles, and Orange County. But what happened was, as those nurseries were built to supply plants to those populations, as the population grew, the nurseries got squeezed out. There was just no place for them anymore. And they said, well, where are we gonna go next? They came to San Diego County, and they relocated here in very, very large numbers. And so in 1978, nursery crops became the number one crop in San Diego County. And I have no entry after 1978 because it has not changed since. The nursery industry, we're the number one nursery county in the United States. They're still here, they're still very robust. In fact, they're still growing and expanding. And it's still a great place to hold, to hold to have nurseries. So if we look at San Diego County today, there's still a large number of nurseries. We're the, we're the top producer of house plants in the country. We're the top producer of cactus and succulents. We're the top producer of landscape plants. And if you drive around the county, if you're looking for those things, you'll, you'll notice there, there's a lot of, very close to here is the Pinery Tree Farm, just right down the hill from you. Massive producer of the 10-inch topiary Christmas trees that are sold at Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmarts, all across the country. So those kind of businesses come here. And it's really, for a simple reason, the weather is so darn good. If you want to grow a topiary Christmas tree to sell at a Home Depot, let's say in Colorado, you really don't produce it in Colorado because you don't have a 12-month growing season. Here we do. So you can produce that crop 12 months a year, and it can grow 12 months a year, and you can turn the crop over much, much quicker. Uh, again, nurseries all over. This is Briggs Tree Farm out in um, Bonsall area. Um, we still grow a lot of cold tomatoes. Um, this is a picture of East Oceanside. If you've ever driven into East Oceanside lately, you'll find about 800 acres of tomatoes and about another 250 acres of Brussels sprouts in East Oceanside. Uh, one family farm has, has been there. They intend to stay there, and they've been for a very long time growing the pole tomatoes and, and growing the, the Brussels sprouts. Um, avocados, of course. Uh, a lot of people think of avocados as the top crop we produce in San Diego County. It's not. Nursery is but it's the top food crop that we produce in San Diego County. And it's a real common sight of seeing the avocados um, on the hillsides because they do very well on the hillsides for two reasons. Avocados require excellent drainage around the roots. So on the hillside, when you're watering, that water will move uh, out of that root zone and, and it will get good drainage. But also, avocados are a subtropical fruit. 
and they cannot handle cold weather. It never freezes on the side of a hill because the cold air continues to move. It never settles and never freezes. So what will happen is the avocado growers will grow the avocados on the side of the hill so we get a freeze, a freeze at night. As long as that air is moving, that cold air is descending, the air doesn't stop and you never get a freeze that damages the avocado. So that's why you'll drive down the 15 corridor and see all those avocados on those uh, steep hillsides. Citrus, um, Palma Valley, uh, San Pasqual Valley, uh, still a tremendous amount of citrus grown there. Um, in the San Pasqual Valley, it's an agricultural preserve, the Whitman family that used to ranch on Camp Pendleton then leased land from the city of San Diego and planted a lot of citrus in San Francisco Valley. Uh, there's others out there. Uh, Rancho Ojito is now uh, getting very, very involved in the citrus avocado wine grape growing uh, business. Um, so a lot of citrus is still being planted in San Diego County. Um, we're moving away from just growing navel and Valencia or oranges. They're planting what's called a cara cara. If you ever see that in the store, buy it. A, a really nice orange. But they're also growing a lot of mandarins. It's been a real, real change in attitudes about mandarin oranges in, in California across the United States because they've been branded as cuties and halos. They're no longer mandarins, they're no longer tangerines, they've been branded, and I'll talk about branding a little bit later, but once those crops got branded, it really increased their visibility and it really increased the demand um, for them. Um, cut flowers, we still grow a lot of cut flowers, but not in greenhouses. So in the cut flower industry, it was centered in the city of Encinitas, it was indoor flowers. We grew orchids, we grew roses, we grew chrysanthemums, we grew carnations, we grew rather uh, delicate flowers. That whole business moved to South America. It moved to Bogota, Colombia, and it moved to Ecuador, where they're paying a day for labor, what we were paying an hour, and their water is extremely inexpensive. And what was discovered was they could put those flowers on an airplane from Bogota, fly it to Miami, put it on a truck, and drive it all over the United States. So we had no transportation advantage there at all. But we still grow a lot of flowers in San Diego County. We just grow hardier perennial crops and we grow them outdoors. And we still have several thousand acres of cut flowers that we grow, um, that we grow outdoors. So if we look at San Diego County, even though a lot of people, it's, a, it's always a, a common thing I hear from people, gee, it's too bad there's no farming in San Diego County anymore. And I said, well, you need to leave the beach, you need to leave the freeway, and you need to get out and drive around. Because there's still a heck of a lot of here. Um, we have the 19th largest farm economy amongst all counties in the United States. So people say, gee, where's, where's the big agricultural counties in, in, in the United States? Well, oh, it's got to be Nebraska, it's got to be Iowa, it's got to be Illinois. There's not a county in any of those states that has as much agriculture as San Diego County. We're number one in nursery production. We're number two in avocado production. We got overtaken by Ventura a few years ago. We're number one in the nation in the number of small farms. Those are farms smaller than 10 acres. Um, we're number one in the nation in the number of organic farms. And we're number one in the nation in, in the number of farmers with off-farm income, part-time farmers. So folks who have a farm, but it's not what they do for a living. They, they do other things in addition, to, uh, in addition to their farming. So we're producing about $1.7 billion a year in agricultural crops in this county today. And that 1.7, that's the value of the farmers we see. That's not the retail value, that's the wholesale value of those crops. As I said, nursery's number one, and it's number one in a big way. It accounts for 65% of the dollars um, that farmers receive in this county. So it is really substantial. Fruit, and that's, that's the combination of, um, the main thing on the fruit would be the avocados, be the citrus, be the strawberries, that's 21% of what we do. Vegetables account for 9%, livestock and poultry, 4%. And we don't produce poultry for meat, we still have poultry for eggs in San Diego County. We're really not a meat production area. Um, and we're down to just two dairies in San Diego County, so that's become a really uh, a small part of what we do. Then the other is less than 1%. And that would be, oh, things like uh, honey, there's still a little bit of uh, alfalfa grown in the county. There's still a little bit of barley grown once in a while, uh, but, but not a tremendous amount. But you can see the, the big things that really do that. I like this pie chart because it does a couple of things. One, it gives you a sense of what is the large crop figure. But on my next slide, you'll notice 65% of the value is nursery and floral, and 4% of the value is livestock and poultry. But if we look at the dedication of acreage, 
-hmm. Livestock and poultry creates 4% of the value that occupies 75% of our agricultural land. Or nursery and floral is producing 65% of the value that occupies only 3% of our agricultural land. It just shows you the difference in intensity of those two different crops. Then everything else kind of falls out about the same. I mean, not that much different. They, they're kind of still in the same order afterwards. So it really, really makes a, a, a tremendous difference uh, on those crops, uh, on the intensity of what you do. Now, that 75% that's dedicated to livestock is mostly cattle grazing in the back country. We don't bring cattle to market size here. What we do here is called cow and calf. And cow and calf is the farmers will have a large herd of cows and a few bulls, and they breed them each year. The cows are drafted, dropped in the springtime. They're raised until they're a couple hundred pounds, and then they're shipped off to feedlots, perhaps in Colorado or uh, El Centro, or even, maybe even further place to places like uh, Nebraska, sometimes up in the San Joaquin Valley. We do not have enough feed here. We do not have enough winter grass here to sustain all the calves that are born, but we can sustain the cows and the bulls. So we, it's called cow-calf. We have the bulls, we have the cows, they drop the calves, get them up to a size, they finish nursing off the mother, uh, separate them, and then we, then we sell them. But they occupy a lot of land. So all these things about agriculture, this value we have, the acreage, and I think on my last slide I talked about the yeah, yeah, 265,000 acres devoted to agriculture in San Diego County. Why would any of us care who don't live in the farm community? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons. One is economic. If that $1.7 billion in value that the farmers receive, that money then goes out back out into the community in terms of payroll, uh, paying for transportation, buying packing materials, pots, soil, everything they do. It's about a $5 billion a year value for the economy of San Diego County. And then there's 20,000 direct and indirect jobs in San Diego County co connected to agriculture. That's a substantial number of jobs. About half those jobs are actually on the farm. The other jobs are either upstream or downstream of the farm, providing the services that farmers need. Then there's environmental values of, of farming in San Diego County. Uh, first of all, I'll mention is air quality. It, you know, it, it, as you hear about, uh, folks are worried now about carbon footprint, they're worried about carbon sequestration, they're worried about climate action plans. The city of San Diego just adopted a climate action plan. In the city of San Diego, one of their plans is to plant 65,000 new street trees in the city of San Diego and become more, create more of a tree canopy in the city of San Diego because trees during the uh, photosynthesis process will sequester carbon and clean the air. And that's really great that they're gonna plant those 65,000 trees in the city of San Diego. We have four million trees in the ground on farms in San Diego County. That 65,000 trees is kind of a drop in the bucket to what we're doing commercially and so, consequently, if the city of San Diego thinks 65,000 trees are going to help clean the air, the 4 million trees that farmers are taking care of are going to sequester an awful lot of carbon as well. Uh, fire suppression, if you've lived here long enough, you know that at least every decade we get these massive fires that start in the east and the wind blows and drives them to the west. And usually the only thing that keeps those fires from getting to the ocean is they run into housing developments and it kind of slows the fires down. But those fires also run into farms. And farms create tremendous fire breaks. A nice irrigated farm, fires will come into a farm, but they very seldom exit the other side. So the farm may be damaged to some degree, but the fire doesn't move through. So there's a really good value in there. Then there's the open space. You know, not the open space we can recreate on, but it's the open space that when we drive around and we just see it and we can enjoy it because farmers are maintaining it. Wildlife will not live or habitate on farmland. But if there's a habitat area here and a habitat area here, the wildlife can move back and forth in between. If that's a housing development or a shopping center, it probably doesn't work for the wildlife. So that those, those wildlife corridors are important too. And then there's the community care. There's the history I've talked about. To me, that's important. I hope it is to a lot of other people. But also local products. We've got 3 million people in San Diego County. We're a, a leading metropolitan area in the United States. But as I said, we're also in the top 20 agriculturally. That's an unusual combination. Usually in the United States, you're either agricultural or you're urban. To have them both in the same county is extremely unusual. Unusual. So it gives us the opportunity, if we want, as San Diego, we can buy local products um, here at our farmer's markets or go to stores that, that, um, that specialize in local products. And then there's just the ambiance of having agriculture and getting out of the city and pretty quickly being in a farming area and enjoy driving to a place like 
San Pasqual Valley or Santa Isabel and, and seeing the farms that are out there. Um, and farming has done well here. And, and historically, this goes back to the beginning of the history of San Diego County, at least the, um, the beginning of the Spanish history uh, of San Diego County. The, the, the re things that have done well for farming. And number one is climate. You can't beat the climate. We can virtually grow anything here. Imported water is huge. We dammed up all the rivers in San Diego County, and that gave some farming opportunities. But when we brought water here in 1947 from the Colorado River, and then in 1972 when we bought, brought water here from the Sacramento Delta, all of a sudden we had a lot of water, and it gave us the ability then to move away from those downstream locations and start planting avocados in a place like Fallbrook and Valley Center and really expanding um, agriculture, what we did. Transportation also has been really important to us. Previous to the interstate freeway system, uh, previous to the interstate freeway system, it was difficult to move perishable products across the country. Once the interstate freeway system was built in combination with the efficient refrigeration on trucks, now you could grow an avocado in a place like Fallbrook and sell it in, in, in Minneapolis. Or you could grow a nursery plant in a place like San Diego and grow it in Texas because transportation became so quick and so easy with the freeway system and refrigeration. Labor supply, um, I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in, in a minute, um, but on labor supply, being close to Mexico, we've always had, almost always had, a pretty good supply of labor. And then local markets. If you're an entrepreneurial farmer in San Diego County and you want to grow something, you've got about 20 million people in Southern California. You don't actually have to go far to look for a market if you want to be creative enough and do that. But um, so those farmers who are going to continue to survive in San Diego County and flourish, there, there are some really serious challenges. And this is kind of where I come, this is what, this is what my job is. This is where I spend my time is on, on these issues. Uh, first one is water, immigration reform, pest exclusion, and the new farmer access. The, the, these are the things that we're very concerned about for the farm community today. And on water, it's not water supply, it's water pricing. It's not a hugely known fact, but we just came through a terrible drought in California. You probably read the stories of 500,000 acres of farmland fallowed in the San Joaquin Valley to get enough water. Uh, we were all asked to cut back on watering lawns. We were all asked to do a very, to, to cut back on our water use. And Californians did a great job. We saved 25, 30%, whatever the number was. We did whatever the governor asked, we did. In San Diego, little known fact, we did that too. We did a really good job of conserving water in San Diego County, but the reality was, all during the drought, we were putting water into storage because we had too much. Because San Diego has an extremely diversified portfolio of water. No place else in the state has as diversified a portfolio of water as San Diego County does. So we have the dams, so we have surface water here. We then, like I said, in 1947, we started bringing water into the Colorado River, largely to take care of the large industrial buildup and population explosion after World War II. We then start bringing water down from Northern California. So now we have three sources of water. We had local water, we had the Colorado River water, and we had the Northern California water. A very good secure supply. Not good enough. We then, as San Diegans, went out and paid for lining all the canals out in the desert in Imperial Valley and the Coachella Valley. Water flows to those farms and those communities by gravity from the Colorado River because they're low. They're in low spots in the desert, so that water can flow by gravity. But they had just dug earthen canals. And so there was a tremendous amount of seepage out of the bottom of those canals, but nobody seemed to care. San, smart people in San Diego, what if we went out and we lined all those canals with concrete? What if we as San Diegans paid to line those canals with concrete? Would you give us the water that used to seep out the bottom? And we did. We got a huge amount of water for that. It was a great expense to us, but we did that. The next thing we did is we then cut a deal and we buy water from the farmers in the Imperial Valley now, up to 300,000 acre feet a year. So we as San Diegans are paying the farmers in the Imperial Valley to put in drip irrigation and to conserve water in exchange. We're getting that water. So we have this, and now we build a desalination plant in Carlsbad. Billion dollars a year, cost a billion dollars to build but it produces 50,000 acre feet of water a year. So what's happened is all these things we're doing are really, really expensive. As homeowners, as residents, we just want the security of the water supply. And the price goes up, we may grouse about it a little bit, but in the end of the day, it's pretty simple. We pay the water bill and we move on. For farmers though, it's been a real challenge and we've had a tripling of our water prices in 11 years. Over 11 years, those of us as residents haven't seen that because our water bill has maybe gone from 
$10 to $30 or $20 to $60, whatever, whatever that tripling is. But if you're a farmer and your monthly water bill was $4,000 and now it's $12, it can be crippling. And it has been a real problem, especially for the crops we grow that are sensitive to the price of water, mostly citrus and um, avocados. And anything else we're going to do in water in California will be very, very expensive as well. Delta and storage fix will be expensive. So we got some issues in California we still need, we still need to do. So nonetheless, water pricing is an issue for farmers. And the net result is farmers have to become extremely efficient with their water and they have to increase the amount of crops they produce with each drop of water they have. The other big issue we have right now is immigration reform. The reality is Farm crops are planted and harvested by foreign-born workers in the United States. California, no exception. California produces 50% of the fruits and vegetables consumed in the United States. We're a really big producer. The rest of the country depends on us. So 90% of the farm work in this country is done by foreign-born workers. Like it or not, we can talk about the politics all day long, but the majority work with forged documents. They're here, they present documents to the farmer, they look good, but we do know that those documents are largely formed, are, for, are forged. So farmers need a reliable legal workforce, and, we, and they don't have it right now. And right now, we have a critical current shortage. Uh, I talked to two farmers, just happened to be yesterday, and I uh, talked to one, and he grows blueberries, and he thinks he's losing about 500 pounds, 500 to 1,000 pounds of blueberries a day. He can't get picked. And his season is now, he's got a three month season. He's got April, he's got May, he's got June, and he's leaving that many blueberries on the ground or on the bush every single day because he can't get enough pickers. Talk to another flower grower, you know, the flower fields in Carlsbad. They figure they've lost between $100,000 and $200,000 this year of flowers they couldn't get picked and get to market. Not enough labor. We have a critical, critical shortage of labor in this, in this country and in San Diego County, it's becoming uh, very, very critical right now. We just don't know what the answer is. Uh, Congress was unable to agree with the President during the Obama administration on a fix for this. And what will President Trump do? Uh, so far, everything we've seen him do has had actually a dampening effect. We've seen a rapid, uh, a rapid loss of farm workers in San Diego County simply because of the rhetoric that's coming out of Washington, D.C. So we need immigration reform if agriculture is going to continue to stay in San Diego County because everything we produce is what we call for the fresh market. We hand plant, we hand pick, we hand grade, and we ship. We're not harvesting our crops by, by trackers and, um, and mechanized means. Uh, pest and pest exclusion, another big issue we have here. The traveling public is constantly introducing new pests into San Diego County, and then the volume of travelers and packages has increased. So the world is full of insects, absolutely full of insects. And when a new insect comes to San Diego, the weather's great, so they can breed 12 months a year, so we get these huge populations. If you live in North Dakota and somebody introduces a new insect pest, it's going to die in the winter. It's just not going to make it, so you don't have this constant population. If somebody needs a, brings a new pest into San Diego County, we've got it, because it's going to breed 12, 12 months a year. And so that becomes really an issue for us. And unfortunately, people ignore, you know if you travel someplace else that you, you, you'll see these things, you'll sign these documents, you'll come through border check stations, don't bring fresh fruits and vegetables into San Diego County. People still do it in huge volumes. A lot of it is coming in packages. People are shipping fruits and vegetables here all the time from foreign countries in packages that are mislabeled and nobody knows that the fruits and vegetables are in them. They open it up and whatever exotic pest is in there then escapes. This is and so what happens if a farmer gets one of these new pests, there could be shipping restrictions. So if you're, let's say you're an avocado grower and you get one of these new insect pests in your grove, the Department of Agriculture may come out and say, you can't ship until you get rid of this pest that's in your grove, put a quarantine on it. And if that's the case, you could miss your harvest season. The other thing is, and this is where the community should really get and be concerned about this, it creates the additional use of pesticides. If you have insects, you've got to kill the insects. And it's really a threat to the organic growers. As I said, we have the largest number of organic growers of any county in the United States, and they're the ones who are really under threat when we get these exotic insects because um, they have fewer tools to, to fight them with. The great examples, we, we have four right now in San Diego County, great examples, fruit flies. Fruit flies come from um, the Pacific Rim. They come from places like Taiwan, Philippines. They come here. Now, 
If you have fruit in your house and you kind of let it get a little ripe, or if you have a fruit tree in your backyard and the fruit falls off, you know fruit flies will, will come and attack. But the fruit flies that we have that are endemic here attack fruit that's rotten or is overripe, and it helps clean it up. The fruit flies that come from places like South America, Central America, and, and the Pacific Rim attack ripening fruit. And the females have an ovipositor, and they can drive that through the fruit, lay their eggs in an orange or an avocado or any piece of fruit before it ripens, the eggs hatch, and the maggots then start to eat the fruit from the inside out. As you can imagine, that's not a very nice thing to open up and get at home. So if you have fruit flies, you end up getting quarantined. Light brown apple moth came from Australia. Somebody brought it here, and now we have a very, very large population of light brown apple moth in the Rancho Santa Fe area, and we have some in Oceanside as well. The larva of the light brown apple moth eats virtually everything. Um, Asian citrus psyllid, as the name implies, came from Asia got into South America, worked its way up into San Diego County. We now have this infesting virtually every citrus grove in, in San Diego County. And now we have the Kurashio shot pole borer, which I think is probably the biggest threat. The predictions are the Kurashio shot hole borer will kill, will kill, this is not if, will kill every single sycamore tree in Southern California. And then it'll attack something else, probably magnolia trees. And this Kurashio shot hole borer also attacks avocado trees. The predictions are that we will lose 38 to 50 percent of the entire tree canopy of Southern California over the next two decades to the Kurashio and its cousin, the Polyphagus shot hole borer. Again, somebody brought these here from Taiwan, Vietnam, or someplace else, and now they've scattered throughout the, throughout the, um, um, through Southern California. If you're familiar with Huntington Gardens, They've had been decimated. UC Irvine has had to remove 500 sycamore trees so far because of this insect pest. We're not hearing those stories, but when it happens, the Tijuana River Valley. Tijuana River Valley, a very wonderful wildlife refuge. If you go down there now, it looks like somebody torched it because the Kurashio Shaho War has virtually killed every tree in the Tijuana River Valley. And so people, my, my point is, people bring these insects here. They don't get here on their own. They not only attack the native habitat, but then farmers have to deal with them as well. And then there's barriers for new farmers. For a new farmer, you come into San Diego County, you want to be a, bar, a farmer? Land is really expensive. It's really difficult to become a farmer. Then there's the quality of the available land. We've already built houses in places like Rancho Bernardo on the very best, flattest farmland. And so what's left are kind of the rocky hillsides. So it becomes a real challenge. Uh, lack of capital. It's very, very difficult anymore. We're not a farm. The, the banks here aren't really thinking of farming, and it's very difficult for someone to go into a bank and now get a, a loan to start a farm. Uh, a lot of folks have little or no experience because I'm guessing most of you here are probably only one or two generations removed from a farmer. You go up your family tree, there's someone who is a farmer. But now your children and your grandchildren are really far removed from that, so they're not thinking about going into agriculture, but now we do have, especially with millennials, we're getting a lot of people say, gee, I want to step out of a fast-paced world, maybe I'll become a farmer. It's kind of a romantic notion, but they have no experience. They don't know about it, but they want to do that. So that's a problem, too. And then there's certainly there's the uncertainty of, on, on profitability. You've got to find that right crop to grow. So looking forward, looking forward on things, uh, farmers are being very innovative. A lot of technology is going into agriculture now, especially on water, water use management, increasing the return per acre, cost controls, niche markets, crop selection. So here's some of the trends I see going forward. These are the things I see that are going to dictate the future of agriculture in San Diego County. One is branding. Now I mentioned that this to you as cuties, and I think this is a crazy example. And there's another one called Palm Wonderful, which is pomegranate juice. This is a company called Paramount agriculture up in the San Joaquin Valley, and they were growing a lot of mandarin oranges and tangerines. And if you remember, not that long ago, you go in the store and there would just be a pile of tangerines, and you put them in the bag and you took them home. People didn't buy very many of them. Well, we got to name these things. So they named them first halos, then they named them cuties. Now people go in and buy these things by the box and buy them by the bag. It's the same fruit we used to buy, but they just named it. So now all of a sudden, we want it. Kids say, oh, I want some halos, I want some cuties. Not saying I want a mandarin and I want a tangerine. They want these branded names. Palm Wonderful is the same thing. Who would have thought pomegranate juice would become mainline? But it is because they produce so much. And they've done it also with pistachios. Pistachios have always been around. They've always been around, but now they've become very, very uh, mainstream. And we're doing branding of products here in San Diego County. Uh, Happy Living Lettuce. 
company Encinitas, and they're, they're now expanding into other parts, and they've, they've branded this Happy Living Lettuce. You go into places like Costco, you'll find Happy Living Lettuce, and Encinitas company has branded that name. Uh, you go into Home Depot, Smart Planet Plants, produced here in San Diego County, all over the United States, Smart Planet, it's a branded plant. So people are trying to not just grow this homogeneous agricultural product, they're trying to brand it to get it in the marketplace. Uh, irrigating with recycled water. We, so we built this really, we built this billion dollar recycling plant in Carlsbad to produce 50 million gallons of water a day for San Diego County. Hey, that's great, helps our water supply. At the same time, we're dumping 150 million, million gallons of water in the ocean from our, our wastewater treatment plants. There's a disconnect there. And the farmers are all saying, why don't you give us that water? Give us that recycled water, and that's happening. City of Escondido, City of Oceanside, Fallbrook Public Utility District have gotten very aggressive. Instead of shipping that water to the ocean, they're turning around, they're selling it to the farmers for about half price of what farmers are used to paying for water. That's huge. To the point, people are now starting to speculate on land in East Escondido to plant avocados because the price of water is going to go so low. This will be really, really a big deal, I think. The public loves local. People are buying local all the time. We haven't tapped this well enough in San Diego County yet. We need the restaurants to get more engaged in that. We need to get more people. Only about 1% of San Diego shop at farmers markets. We just don't know. We haven't gotten over the hump to get more of that to happen. Uh, avocado dense planting. Avocados have traditionally been planted 100 trees per acre for a really simple reason. In the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, the whole time planting avocados, pipe came in 20 foot sections. So you planted an avocado tree every 20 feet. Land was cheap, so you put your pipes out, you put a spring foot head every 20 feet, and then you go another 20 foot length of pipe and you plant another tree. Well, you've now discovered that's all wrong. That was a really bad idea, and it was convenient. Now they're planting trees three to 400 per acre, and so they're getting more avocados. So instead of averaging 6,000 pounds of avocados per acre, they're going to average more like 25,000 pounds of avocados per acre, and believe it or not, use less water when they do that. So that's really, really remarkable. So avocado dense planting, you don't know it, but if you drive around, you'll see abandoned avocado groves, but you'll also see dense planted groves that are putting a lot of trees uh, per acre. Uh, the predictions are we will grow more avocados than we ever have in the past. It'll just be on fewer acres because of the dense planting. Low water use plants. So California is changing its water ethic. We're changing our landscape. Somebody needs to grow those plants. We're going to do it here in San Diego County. We're the ones growing those low water use plants. Hydroponics. I never would have guessed that hydroponics would make sense because our weather's so good, let's just grow our vegetables outdoors. The science of hydroponics, and this is the farm in Encinitas, is that same happy lettuce farm. They can grow five times the amount of vegetables in the same acreage as you could outdoors and use 85% less water. When you water into the soil, most of that water goes down or evaporates into the atmosphere. Here, it all stays within the greenhouse environment. The humidity stays high. The water is running through these channels and watering the lettuce, and uh, it gets, recycled, gets cleaned up and recycled. Dragon fruit. Um, just as avocados were an ethnic food at one point in time, uh, you may not know this, they used to be called alligator pears, and people didn't buy them because the name wasn't good, and the idea was to change the name to avocado, which is a genetic name. And so, eventually they become, they're everywhere now. You go everywhere, avocados, you expect to see them in the store all the time, where they used to be very, very exotic. Now they're in every subway, and on every salad, every, every restaurant has a California something, your eggs or your salad or your dinner, and all these put an avocado on call it California food. Um, but dragon fruit, is dragon fruit gonna be that next big crop that we can grow in San Diego and create huge demand? If you haven't tried them, you ought to. They're also very good for juice. It's a member of the Cactaceae family, and as the name might imply, it doesn't need a whole heck of a lot of water to produce fruit. Uh, farmers have been getting five to ten dollars a pound for these things, so it's really tremendous. Uh, wine grapes, the fastest growing segment of the agriculture industry in San Diego County right now is wine grapes. They're being planted in very fa fast order. Uh, you drive around. If you get a chance, drive through Highland Valley someday and look at all the wine grapes out there, or drive up areas like Fallbrook and out in Valley Center. A lot of wine grapes are going in. People are planting them almost as, as fast as they can. There's a bit of a shortage on plants right now. If you want to plant some wine grapes, maybe a two or three year wait to get the plants that you need. Uh, certified organic continues to grow. 
Uh, a lot of people are demanding organic, so that continues to be an, uh, a growing part of the economy. Olives. In my history slides, I talked about the fact that we grew a lot of olives in Fallbrook, we grew a lot of olives in Spring Valley. What happened to those industries was post-World War II, part of our reconstruction of Europe, we helped subsidize the olive oil business in places like Portugal, Spain, and Italy, and it actually put the olive growers in the United States out of business because they were selling the olive oil so cheap in the U.S., our, our olive growers couldn't compete. And so consequently, we lost all our olive trees, and those olive industry trees are now lining the streets of places like Rancho Bernardo. Those are the trees that used to be on farms. They just, avocado trees transplant really well, so they took them from the farms, and they became street trees across San Diego County. But now we're planting olives again. And we have s several substantial plantings of olives in San Diego County. Driven by this local thing, to create a local label, Olive oil produced in San Diego County, these farmers are betting there's going to be some demand for that. Urban farming, don't know quite where that's going to go, but there seems to be some interest in filling in uh, vacant lots, urban farming, gardens. And then niche markets, finding these niche markets, not just growing volume and tonnage of fruit, there's a company called um, Bellavado in Valley Center that's selling avocado oil, and it's become very, very popular. There's a company out in, also in Valley Center, Archie's Acres, that's growing basil. So if you go to the store, you can buy basil that's still alive. They're selling the whole plant, including the roots. It's been very popular. They're sold out all the time. Uh, their biggest customer is Whole Foods, and they just can't produce enough. So finding those niche markets are another thing that folks can do as well. I think that's my last slide. It is. I think I came in on time. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions any of you might have on the, on the things I've discussed. Um, yes? I was just going to add something interesting about the olives. Um, from right here at the Bernardo Winery, there. Um, well, it used to be 360 acres with a lot of olives because of the tuna industry. So they were supplying. Ah, yes, <laughs> I've heard that as well for, the, for packing the tuna. Yeah. Olives also have been challenged here because we do have an endemic fly here, fruit fly, the yellow fruit fly, that attacks olives. So farmers have to be very, very vigilant in, in keeping the, the fruit flies out of their olive groves um, as well. But I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot of promise for olives here again, not for the fresh market. Um, but for the oil market and that local name of the San Diego produced um, olive oil. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, with the shot borer, what's the natural control predator? I mean, is there something that can't it's, it here, Here's the problem with the shot hole borer. This is what makes this insect more deadly than most any other. And it's, it's really become a problem because the, the very first thing anybody does is you try to find the natural, there is a natural predator to this Asian citrus soap, and they're breeding and releasing it as fast as they can. They have a natural, they have a, a control for fruit flies. It's very interesting. They take male fruit flies, they do this up in LA, and they produce them by the millions. They take the eggs of the fruit flies and they float them, and the male eggs float, the female eggs sink. They take all those male eggs, they hatch them out, and then they radiate the males and makes them sterile. And then they dye them pink. Okay. And there's planes that fly over all the time releasing these sterile male fruit flies over Southern California and over Northern Mexico. Fruit flies mate once. So when the females, the fertile females, mate with the sterile male, they're done mating, they never lay eggs, and eventually the population wipes out. So there are strategies for those of these. The shot hole bore, See this mouth part right here? Why it's called a bore? It envisions something like, like, like these big tunnel boring machines for building canals and bridges, I mean tunnels underground. That insect is built the same way, and it bores its way into the tree. Once it's in the tree, that female, if she's already fertilized, when she goes in there, she lays her eggs, and the family lives inside the tree forever. Her offspring, they don't need to find another family. Her male and female offspring can breed and they do not have a genetic problem with that. And so the population continues to expand inside the tree. The other thing that makes them difficult is within their mouth parts, they carry a disease called fusarium. And when they go in, as they're boring through the trees, they're leaving all this fusarium in the tree, and the fusarium continues to grow. They, that's what they eat. They don't eat the tree. They're like a drill bit. They drill into the tree to live, but they eat the fusarium disease. It's a bacterial disease. It's a bacterial disease that affects the tree, but they live off that. So they're actually farming inside the tree. The tree will either die from all the tunneling or from the fusarium. Doesn't, one, one or the other is going to kill the tree. And so it becomes a real, real problem because this insect is now inside the tree. 
And so what they're working with now are traps. They're trying to come up with pheromones that the males will think it's a female, come out of the tree and go into the traps and be killed and hopefully cut down the breeding population that well. But it hasn't proved to be highly effective yet. But nonetheless, it is, this is a real problem. The Kurt Shield Shop War is a, is a tremendous problem for, for those reasons. Very why? Do they have wings? You know, I, I don't, you know, um, I'm not convinced that they do because the population spreads very slowly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, when they spread is when the tree they've killed falls, and then then it dis distributes the young. There may be a flying stage. I, I'm not a, I'm not an entomologist. I'm not enough expert on that. Um, I, I just know that it it just creeps out slowly mm -hmm. over an area. So the biggest struggle is the way they think it's been spreading mostly is someone has a tree that dies. They call a gardener. They come in. They chop it down throw it in the back of their truck and as they're driving they're spreading these things all over the place as they go because the, the insects are then escaping from this dead tree but the dead trees then move from point A to point B and so now it gets spread and they think, that, think that's what happened at UC Irvine so UC Irvine had some, some, some sycamore trees that died so the crew, the, the, the tree people would come in before they knew it, chop down the tree, chop it all up, maybe even throw it in the chipper. Well, a chipper doesn't make the chip small enough to kill this bug. This bill, that, that thing's about the size of a flea. Very, very, very small. And as they moved off, then they take these wood chips, oh, these are great mulch. Let's take these, let's take these wood chips and we'll spread it all over the place. And what they were doing is they were spreading the insect all over the campus and caused a real so, yeah. so where do they come from? And there must be something in, in their habitat that's resistant to them or else it would be denuded. Yeah, and, that, and, and uh, there have been a number of scientists from mostly UC Riverside have been traveling to Taiwan, traveling to Vietnam, and they have captured some pests mm -hmm. that they think are possibly the, um, uh, the natural predators <coughs> for those insects. So there is some hope for that, yeah. um, but it's very, very down the road. Uh, it's very down the road. Yeah. And there could be some other things that happen that they're surviving very well in our atmosphere. They, maybe the high humidity there slows them down or something. We don't have that here, so they haven't quite put a handle on that. But it very, very, very serious problem. One of the biggest insect threats we, we, will, we have probably ever experienced in Southern California. It's, it's a big one. It's a real big one. Yeah. Anybody else on anything we discussed today? Okay, I'm going to close with one last thing, if you don't mind. This will be my shameless um, pitch. Um, there's a group called Friends of Farming in San Diego County. For $27,000 $27, a year, you can become a friend of farming. And then what we do is we open up farms several times a year. No additional cost, you can tour the farms. So it's a way to get access to farms and support the farm community. So if, you, if you're interested, grab one of the brochures and for Friends of Farming in San Diego County. All right. All right. Oh. Thank All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.